The following lecture is a presentation of the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, Farms, at Brigham Young University. It was given as part of a conference at BYU titled Temples Through the Ages on December 4th, 1999. Brother Nibley is Emeritus Professor of Religion and Ancient History here at the university. His PhD is from the University of California at Berkeley. He's written extensively on the Book of Mormon, and particularly on the Book of Abraham. And I think if you were to select one other theme that has been the focus of his long years of scholarship and work, it would be on the Temple. Farms and Deseret Book have, to date, published 13 volumes in the collected works of Hugh Nibley. You might be interested to know that there are 12 other volumes under consideration and under preparation in that collected works. That corpus of work itself, I think, is a testament to the amount of of uh, effort that he's put into his studies and his scholarship over the years. He's currently working on a manuscript entitled One Eternal Round, Facsimile 2 in the Pearl of Great Price. Professor Nibley. Those who saw the recently uh, TV documentary, Joseph Smith, American Prophet, may have noticed an interesting defect in the script, namely that it was Hamlet with Hamlet left out. And this is what Brother Ricks was talking about. We don't begin to know how to estimate Joseph Smith. Excuse me if I swig. <laughs> you know, nothing like the bottle to give you comfort. <laughs> now, now, here we go. It was as if one were to produce a life of Shakespeare with charming views of Stratford-on-Avon, country school, the poaching story, marriage to Anne Hathaway, Showbiz in London, respectable retirement, without bothering to mention that our leading character gave the world the greatest treasury of dramatic art in existence. <coughs> or the life of Bach, with his niggardly brother guardian, his early poverty, his odd jobs with local organs and choirs, his acceptance in the courts of the empire, his 19 children, and his loving nature, without a word about the greatest volume of music ever produced by a mortal. It's the same thing with Joseph Smith. They told us everything about him and told us nothing about him, as I think <laughs> what Brother uh, Ricks had just told us. No one has the slightest inkling of the mass and charge of his legacy to us. <coughs> I sometimes think how it would be... I don't have a book moment here. I sometimes think how it would be if I had to hand in a term paper, the subject of which was a thousand-year history of a nation in detail, fiction, if you will, or anything else, but one semester to do it in. Panic as the day approaches. I've got to get that paper and I have one more week. What will I do? What on earth will I write? What can I put in the book? He has to write this book. This kid, everybody's talked about it, you know. The newspapers have been heckling, Morris our signal, the newspapers have been heckling and guffawing. Everybody was waiting for Joe to fall on his face. Surprise, surprise, he brought out the book. 500 pages of factual information. This is a tremendous book, you see. He brought, oh, quite a book. This is, how, would you, how long would it take you to produce this? Just free to do anything you want, put in anything you want. That could be fiction. You don't have to have anything real at all. He produced this thing. Nobody ever considered nothing like that. It's ever happened before <laughs> or since. It's unbelievable. Well, it certainly is. Nobody will believe it. The... Uh, <laughs> The, uh, get, some, get some light here. Uh, <clears throat> so, what do you put into it? Anything you want to, but it had very good. Uh, he brought out the book, as I say, 500 pages, and on time, and invited the critics to do their worst. And, of course, everybody, including ourselves, has avoided the big question, how did he do it? <laughs> this just gets me. Local mobs chased him down country roads and broke into his house at night, but nobody was able to explain where he got the book. In the same sense, does anyone alive have the re vaguest clue as to what Joseph really gave us in the temple? That was the greatest of all. The book of Abraham tells us a lot about it, but who reads the book of Abraham? In a letter dated February the 26th, 1991, the director of the Berlin Egyptian Museum, in answer to an LDS student, responded, quote, 
The interpretations printed in the three facsimiles have nothing to do with Egyptian beliefs. They are pure fantasy. In the last sentence, however, the director obligingly refers his correspondent to Professor Eric Hornung, specifically in his book The Valley of the Kings, which he recommends as giving the real explanation of the Egyptian drawings. He says, you look at this book of Hornung's. Now, this is welcome, welcome advice. Since Professor Hornung is probably the supernova of the so-called New School of Egyptology. He's the best man going today. So, obedient to the good director, we turn at once to Hornung's guidebook, which refers us to the works of yet another giant. He, he writes, Egyptian historiography reaches its high water mark with Edward Meyer. With all haste, we repair to the books of Meyer, who bids us all students of ancient religion to seek wisdom in the works of giant number four. <laughs> now we're quoting my going down the line here. He says, Mormonism is one of the most instructive, one of the most instructive phenomena in the whole area of religious history. That was his specialty ancient religion, the great Edward Meyer, you know, the last great scholar of religious history. And it is most remarkable that the students of religion who have sought enlightenment in the most remote, inaccessible, and all but incomprehensible religions of the past have kept themselves strictly aloof from Mormonism and disdained the rich instruction it has to offer. This singularity meant nothing to anyone, he assures us. It is the case of Joseph Smith that sheds light upon all the others and helps us to reach an understanding of the fundamental Problems. Now, that's a great recommendation for Meyer, but what about Meyer himself? This is my point. Though the great Edward Meyer was impressed enough to come to Utah in 1904 and carry on his investigations here, he never bothered to read the Book of Mormon. He wouldn't look at it. Now, what have you got there? This is the main testimony of the man. Meyer wouldn't look at it. See, we're all, we're all avoiding something here, aren't we? He claimed that only Mormon, he says, only Mormon could have the patience to get it through it. <laughs> and for him, the Pearl of Great Price just doesn't exist. And yet, this is a partial, a special field, a special field. For that very reason, he could not lower himself to take it seriously. Joseph Smith's resurrection of the temple should have electrified him, but in those days, it was fashionable in Egyptologists to hold all religion, and especially that of crazy, irrational Egyptians, in contempt. They did it for very reason, you know. All my teachers did, and so forth. Another swing, gosh. This is the Irish in me coming out. I won't be able to leave <laughs> uh, Well, it's another picture today. The so-called New School of Egyptology. i to get some light here. New School of Egyptology has forced and held its full, its full attention on the religion of Egypt. Almost every leading scholar has written a work of all things on the Egyptian concept of the other world, the hereafter, which requires deep searching into temple and funerary literature. And they recognize essentially the same. The funeral literature of the Egyptians is temple literature. It began, the, uh, the, well, the pyramid texts, for example, are both. Why? They both have the same person, to get you over into the other world. The funeral literature and the temple literature, the temple is just where you make contact with the other world. So, uh, the ancient world was filled with temples. You know that, we said it before. But it really was. Two centuries of worldwide comparative studies have come up with the conclusion that there existed throughout the world from the most ancient times a body of religious beliefs and practices centered around the temple. Everyone recognized the sameness of the dominant theme and allows for local variation, but there's one called the temple throughout the entire world. Very strange. But it's generally agreed that we have bold common concepts prevailing from prehistoric times right down to Christianity, virtually unchanged. There's a general agreement today, strange as it seems, it's come recently, that uh, the temple rites and the funeral rites all had the common intent, namely to see the subject safely through this world and secure in the next as a resurrected and exalted being. Resurrection and eternal life were the, the engrossing, the engrossing uh, concern of religion from the beginning. Everybody thinks that now. To make a, such a transition, the temple was necessary, being defined just the way you usually find as the, 
a place of contact, Horan calls it the interface, a place where this world and that world meet. It's always been that, where the two worlds come together. And uh, between the worlds above and below the earth. More recently, emphasis has been put on the function relating to the cosmos. It relates to the cosmos. It's, it's where we take off. Well, Horning doesn't hesitate to use the figure of, of space travel. He says the, uh, the, mummies, the mummy case is really a module for traveling through space, to reach other worlds. They go into all that sort of thing now. This was the only solution to the, same, the one great problem that has ever haunted the human race. One great problem, the problem of facing death. And we have suddenly come to acknowledge that the one problem that all of us are and ever have been concerned with is that question first of all. I'm going to address going to be very civilized now. <clears throat> the Neo Freudians there's a very good book recently by Becker on this subject and won a very important prize. The Neo-Freudians have finally recognized that the rediscovery of modern psychology, we're quoting here, that death is man's peculiar and greatest anxiety, outranking even sex. In his prize-winning book, Ernest Becker finds, he says, that all the historic religions addressed themselves to this same problem of how to bear the end of life. Religions like Hinduism and Buddhism performed the ingenious trick of pretending not to want to be reborn, he says. They not so are Egyptians. Morantz has pointed out the complete contrast between what he calls the eternity of the Egyptian individual and the transmigration of the Indians. The one is determined to be himself forever, as Brigham Young says, and the other is resigned to becoming anything you please. A drop of water in an ocean of being is preferable. Well, if modern scholars are depressed by the mortuary atmosphere of Egyptian culture, our modern world has even more demoralizing message. The absolute scientific we're quoting here, the absolute scientific certainty that man goes back into the ground a few feet in order blindly and dumbly to rot and disappear forever, taking with him his vast unreal, unrealized potential. No wonder, he says, the full apprehension he's quoting Pascal here, the full apprehension of man's condition would drive him insane. That one there is, you think of Second Nephi 7 and 9, he says, if the course of nature is followed, we must go down into the earth to rot and decay and rise no more. See? But something must be working against that. The very thing that he uses, you see, and you find uh, lots of charms in the Egyptian uh, against a spell against in all the, the literature against Pharaoh will not rot, he will not decay, he will not putrefy. They talk a lot about the stink and the rot and the dust, dust and the smell and everything. And it's very unpleasant, but they've got to face it, they say. And uh, Eliada concludes his work on the cosmos and history with a warning that unless we find a new formula for man's collaboration with creation, to give tragedy a meaning, we must be prey to continual terror. We're not approaching the new millennium, and lots of people are scared stiff, you see, that's what he's talking about. And the temple provides the formula. Since death cannot be denied, it can't, you know, it really happens, what hope is there for the hereafter? The Egyptian answer, as everybody is recognizing today, and everybody says this and repeats it, was to start all over again and have a new life. That meant new creation. But how is that to be affected? There is one glowing example which no one can overlook, and that's the sun. The Egyptians, all the other people too. The Egyptians, like other ancient people, made the most of it. Stick close to the sun, was the idea, and do what he does. Get yourself a place in his boat as a crew member, attendant, uh, sign on as, as, as an assistant, or a, a Shemesre, a member of the family, or, or one of his his uh, religious followers. To prolong your old life, you must get in on the action. You must be present at the only time and place that the sun completed his one cycle. And of course, that was the solstice, the winter solstice, when the sun reaches the bottom and for an unspeakable brief second and then starts going up again. That's when you jump onto the boat. The, uh, yes, the, the Romans had a very interesting name for that. Well, anyway, the sun completes completing one cycle and reaching the other, the lowest point, without a split second, 
hesitation, reverses his direction and starts the upward climb. That's when you must join in. So you must be there at that particular place, that moment of creation, when the sun begins his new life. This means that everybody in the world has to come together at a special place, the exact center of the cosmos, since the point of convergence for the pilgrims from roads from every direction, the only place they can commonly meet was be in the center of everything. That figured out. And for the beginning of a new life cycle, you must start the creation all over again, and that's the creation drama we talked about that you see in the temple and, and Abraham has given us. As far as we can trace the records of the ruins, there have been great gatherings of, of the race. The panegyrist means everybody gathered in a circle in every part of the world. Many have recognized the phenomenon, but no one can explain how or when it began. Edward Meyer thinks it started with the animals in their periodic meetings to disport and reproduce. They, they come together and have groups. You see in various documentaries, they do that, wolves. And deer. And I got into a herd of, uh, of uh, elk well, having a great celebration, uh, trump, trumpeting and everything else. They were quite wild. But no, they come together regularly for, to reproduce and get the world going again. So Edward Meyer said, animals do, why don't we? Megalithic circles, these great stone circles marking the ceremonial assemblies are found by the thousands and go back to the Tone Age. Over 10,000 of them have been counted. I had the good fortune to be stationed at Avebury in what Hereford says, that's the greatest and one of the oldest and largest, one of the oldest uh, of the centers in the world at the end of the late war, war and had ample time to examine the vast establishment. That was before it was discovered before the tourists. The stone circle, 1,400 feet in diameter, it's a huge thing, a great artificial mound was there called Silbury Hill, the highest artificial mound in Europe. To beckon the pilgrim from afar, it took 35 million baskets of earth to build that, that Silbury Hill. You can see it from miles away. That from a community that's calculated of only 500 souls, how long would it take to dump 35 million baskets to, to, to build that artifact? It's the mountain of the, the Lordberg. It's the mountain of the Lord's house, the mountain of the law. See, the, the temple is on the mountain of the Lord. There always has to be a mountain from which you recognize the place that, you, that you're going to. That's a big subject in itself, you see. Uh, <coughs> the... Uh, the mountain dominated the flat surrounding plain. This flat, and it's littered with bones still of lunching and fasting. The people came there and feasted, and they camped there. That was where the camping that was, the great camping place. Remember the camps in all these places. Thou shalt not celebrate the Passover within thy gates, which the Lord thy God gives thee. You must make the trip. And if you go, you have to camp out there. You get this in the Book of Mormon, you see, at, the, at Mosiah's coronation then uh, you have to live in tents, so it becomes a festival of the booths everywhere. The word booth, our word booth, is the same as the word Hebrew and Arabic. Bait is a house. Bait, booth, our word bait means to stay the night over. Uh, and it, it's international, you find it everywhere. The booth, the bait, abide with me, there's even tied. Why do you abide? You abide in the booth, and the booth is the bait, which is the house. And the temple is called the bait. That's the house of God. That's the bait. So this is out in a wild place, because as we were told, they needed shelter from the elements while they were camping out there. We get the same picture in the Book of Mormon very vividly. Joseph Smith knew all the answers on that one. Well, from the air, I had to pass over this place slowly, quote, in regular and frequent glider frights, and I could behold the traces of prehistoric roads marked by standing stones leading from all directions. That's the general layout of countless ceremonial centers. As I say, there are over 10,000 of them have been registered. According to Aubrey Burrell, the principal authority, it is strangely parallel in North America where the collapsed trading networks of the Hopewell were followed by the Temple Mound societies. According to the British Circle, according to him, the British Circles were separated from Cahokia, that's in North America, by 3,000 years and 4,000 miles, <laughs> the Atlantic Ocean. And the, but the Cahokia culture definitely goes back to Teotihuacan, and nobody doubts, well, somebody may doubt, but they look so much alike, they're peas in a pod, it's astonishing. Strangely, I was prepared, prepared for this surprise earlier in Berkeley. I, eight years earlier in Berkeley, I had produced a long, laborious comparative study, a thesis examining eyewitness accounts of some 15 such holy centers, 
scattered widely throughout the old world. There were 15 accounts, but went all to the same places. The same things happened. Within a year of returning from the army, I went straight to Provo, where I met Brother Virgil Bushman, a great missionary to the Hopi and Navajos, who urged me to come with him and see something of the ancient world in Arizona. I have described our arrival in Hota Villa in a piece called Promised Lands, and this is the way it was put. I was stunned what I saw as we came through a low arch at dawn. It was a cold March morning, the first dance year, and there was nobody there, just a few little kids watching, some old people hunched in blankets around the top. But this place was nobody, was, and this magnificent theater was going on. Here we are on a high rock with nothing but desolation. I'll post, remember these in the, the Hopi Mesas, nothing but desolation in all directions you could look on. And out in this cold nothing, as if it was suspended in space, I see a full scale drama in procession. Well, it was like a revelation. What's going on? It was a terrific show. And and he said, the spectra, a splendid drama in progress here on the high bleak rock surrounded by nothing that you would call total desolation in all directions, the full scale drama in progress in the grand manner of the ancients. Everything is being carried out with meticulous care. All the costumes were fresh and new, blowing in the wind. Nothing artificial. All the dyes, all the woven stuff, all the properties, nothing could be gotten in a store. Everything had to be from nature. What an immense effort and dedication that these, these people had. And for what? They were the only people in the world that still took the trouble to do what the human race had been doing for many millennia, celebrating the great life cycle of the year, the creation, the dispensations. I told Brother Bushman when the, the uh, dancers started coming out, there should be 52 dancers, and there were 52. That's the sacred number of the Aztecs, sacred number of the Mongols. It's the sacred number of Israel. Remember Israel? They had the 52 shavit, the 52 staves of the tribes in the Ark of the Covenant, were 52 seals, each representing a tribe of Israel, the same 52. You get these same customs everywhere, and it's, it's quite uh, astonishing, to say the least. Uh, well, then all celebrating at the same time of the year, and all celebrating the same way, all these other people. This was at Hota Villa, which today is an exciting new study. It's been revived now. That, it was just about dead when I visited by a special invitation a couple of years ago. I stayed with the chiefs and so forth, and uh, they'd given up. They weren't going to plant anymore or do anything more. But now there is a revival in this book of Thomas Mayles, uh, he's written a large book on this, but quite a useful one called Hoda Villa, The Hopi Shrine of the Covenant, The Microcosm of the World. And they say, what village is that? They're quite serious about it. Uh, well, I have taken some beautiful, through the years, I have taken some beautiful, I've gone through over 50 years, I've been going to visit them, very well known. The first generation was gone. Uh, I've taken some beautiful reproductions of Egyptian papyri to show to the children and to the elders in Hota Villa, and they have been greatly impressed by the resemblances to their own rituals that the dancers always have to have in both the cultures, in both the Egyptian and the Hopi, the two feathers in the head, the copper bracelets on the arms, the fox tail behind, it must be there, the fox or, or coyote tail behind, the bandolier over the shoulder, and you have to have the face paint is very important. The oldest records we have are the, are the palettes used for mixing the paint to paint the faces of the dancers. And so the, the, the same cult's going on everywhere. It's the most marvelous thing. Uh, and when I've taken professors from Israel to visit the Hopis, they were simply bowled over. Uh, what's his name, Professor Shinar, who teaches Hebrew at Hebrew University, uh, who teaches Arabic at Hebrew University, I paid us a visit, and I took him down there with the, with the Rafi brothers, who were Israelis. And he saw, well, he saw a woman was making something, was reading something. He said, what's that? And I said, that's a shawl, a prayer shawl. He said, well, we have the same pattern. I said, what do they call it? He said, it was a sheesh. He nearly fainted. He said, that's what we call it. <laughs> and, and Rafi, a little boys were beating some drums on the mound. And Rafi stopped and said, no, wait a minute, listen to that song. And he joined in and sang with them. He says, that's a song, we used to sing that in my village. Now, how permanent is this stuff? It gives you the creeps. <laughs> <laughs> no, you've got to consider, but this has been checked on many times. See, this is, well, we talk about this just briefly here, but we'll get, get around to this. This recognition of a 
prehistoric worldwide order of things, religious and political, picked up speed with the founding of the East India Company in 1773, eager young Englishmen discovering the, the East and the primacy of the Sanskrit language. They broke out into the open field with, quote, inquiring to all languages to reduce them to one common center from which they spread into Park Rays of the Sun. They decided that we're just one common language, one common culture. And this was decided way back there, you see, and that it was Sanskrit in India. Now, the progress of science is marked by the writings of the great Max Miller. First of all, 1849 to 73, he translated his monumental Rig Veda Samavita. And then he wrote a broader work next called The Origin and Growth of Religion, 1879. And finally, he ends up with a wide-ranging science of mythology and Finally, to the next step, he says, if the heathens already possessed an abundant stock of religious myths, then among, then song and story could not fail to interweave themselves with the rites and customs. Throughout the world, students started studying these various major events, especially this yearly event, this New Year rite, the great celebration, of the uh, year rite, uh, and started making lists of what they went on. Everybody had his lists, and then they started comparing these lists, and they were compared practically the same, usually the same five main things were the same. They displayed surprising agreement and conformity, especially in the five events, George Lincoln said. Eliada strings together, well, Eliada strings together the, the place, the celestial prototype, the art, the act of creation, the creation of the world, the sacred marriage, the, Adam and Eve, the confrontation with evil, Satan, the victory of the king, the coronation. To these, he adds the atoning sacrifice, cleansing the people of their sins, the memories of paradise, festivities wistfully but happily recalling the golden age. As we summed up the picture many years ago, at hundreds of holy shrines, see, I, I collected records of dozens of them. I wrote up 15 of them, but I got, a, got over 50. Uh, as we summed up pictures many years ago, at hundreds of holy shrines, each believed to mark the exact center of the universe, representing as the point at which the four corners of the earth converged, the navel of the earth, they called it, Omphilus, one might have seen assembled of the new year the moment of the creation, the beginning of time, vast concourses of people, each thought to represent the entire human race in the presence of all the ancestors uh, ancestors and gods. The, trend can be, the whole trend can be summed up in an astonishing statement quite recently made by Eliade, just before he died. I knew him at Chicago. And here. This is what he wrote. <laughs> it's almost unbelievable for a responsible scientist to say this. In extremely diverse cultural context, we always find the same cosmological pattern and the same ritual scenario as man progressively occupies increasingly vast areas of the planet. All seem, they seem to do is repeat indefinitely the same archetypal gesture. They're going through the same thing wherever you are. That's a very sweeping statement to make. The great object of the Egyptian ritual was, and I quote here, from Westendorf, a very good Egyptologist, the creation, maintenance, and continuation of life beyond death in the cosmos as well as on earth. After creation, <clears throat> the vital forces of all creatures had to be preserved for eternity, this being accomplished by a continuous renewal or rejuvenation, and for this they have the temple. It is a case of, as Horan says, of periodically recharging the sun. This requires the aid of all living things. Mankind must cooperate in the, dare say, the best French scholar on this subject, the rites and ordinances that express the unity of the universe, which must be repeated to keep up man's awareness of them, without which the whole structure would vanish. We must participate. If you're going to live forever, you're better. And Alexander Sharp says, everything meaningful is brought together in a single meaningful whole. Everything has to be brought together at this particular time, at this particular place, and then a new age can begin. It was both Natalia and the great birthday and resurrection when everybody went wild with good news that the death had been overcome and the hero had risen. And I quote a number of early Christian writers here who report what they saw in Egypt. But then showing that there was the resurrection. 
not the least significant note on the importance of the temple is that it is the source and origin of civilization. Everything comes from it, you notice. Can you consider the spin-offs of this great year, right, generated throughout the world? It goes back, as I say, to prehistoric times. In fact, uh, Paleolithic. The bringing together of vast numbers of peasants from widely scattered regions, bringing their offerings to the temple, required an exchange for converting their substance to acceptable offerings. Hence, you have banks. The bank means the bench of the exchange artists of the money changers in the courts of the temple, in the outer court of the temple. You, you'd exchange what you brought locally, so what well, could be acceptable here, just you have to exchange when you go to another country, you change your money. So the banks started out with the temples. We know that well. Our word money, Juno Moneta, in Rome, the first, when you came to the capital, the first place you had to talk, to talk, stop and declare yourself was the, on the capital as Juno Moneta. Moneta means she protected the, she protected the city. It was on watch to see that nothing fully went on. So you went up there and you declared yourself and, and that, that was the money. And the place where you would change it was on the benches. They had the, the benches. They still have them there, you see, on, on the wharf, say, at the Piraeus. They have their black velvet little stand set out with the money, coins on them, you make the exchange. That's a bank. That's a bank. That's our word bank, you see. And the, our temples are still banks. You see the, the marble and the bronze and the, the sanctimonious hush and above all the inner sanctum when you go down to which is, which is the vault. Of course, that's the Holy of Holies. That's the... Uh, just taking it over completely substitute. You see. It's an interesting thing. Well... <coughs> The exchange of goods and services was the great opportunity of the year. It was one time and place at which servants could be hired out for a year and a day was the formula. For long, dangerous journeys, you had to have the pilgrims coming. You had to have hostels and hospitals had to be provided. The local youth inevitably engaged in demonstrations of local pride and prowess, songs, dances, races, athletic events, dramatic recitations, competitions, Plays by traveling troops, clowns, the best time to sell your stuff is at the yard market, at the yearly market, when everybody comes together. This is where all civilization is, is centered. There's a good deal of whole German school about that sort of thing. Homer, Homer has given us a, uh, the whole picture in the hymn to Apollo. He says, the gods look down and see man suffering below there, and it's a terrible time. We used to be together, now they're down there, and they're awful, because he says, they're poor, helpless creatures, they're stupid, they're a mechanist, they don't know how to take care of themselves, and he says, above all, they don't have an acus, they don't have a cure for death or old age. So what are we going to do? Well, I said, let's meet with them from time to time, he says. So, so Leto, the mother of, uh, <coughs> of Apollo, decides to send her son down and establish these meeting places where every year people would come and he describes how they come together. We'll meet with them and for a time we'll feast together and they'll have a, have a golden age and feel very happy about it and we'll distribute them throughout the whole world and the pilgrims will come from all directions. When they get there they'll be all changed here. They change their dusty clothes to white robes. They'll wash themselves off and they'll anoint themselves to engage in, in rites and so forth. It'll be very nice. And uh, for a time, we'll have a visit with them. They'll know that we belong to them. Well, this is the idea of the temple. You get it everywhere, you see. You may turn the tape over now to continue the program. So, he'd establish a line of temples where the people could gather at the New Year, all dressed in white, bringing their rich gifts, feasting and dancing, having a wonderful time while celebrating the creation of the world. First of all, the temple was the home of the arts. And most of all, the temple of the arts and science. You had to have the portraits of the ancestors. And that was, well, they have the records. <coughs> the library was absolutely vital because those were where the, where the, uh, the genealogy was kept. And the, well, that's what, that's, that's what Breslin decided, too. When you talk about the house of life, the library, that means genealogy and records. And your history is kept there. And they had the sacred images and the, the portraits we find from the most remote periods, I mean, six, seven thousand years ago, are ex exquisite works, tr true works of art, and the paintings and so on and so on. Goes, all, your, your, all your civilization comes from the temple. The temple itself was a sacred edifice built according to strict rules of divine proportions. Vitruvius's great work on architecture, everything has to be significant in the structure to to harmonize with the universe itself. 
The only important time of rites and festivals required close observation of the heavens. There were astronomical, obs- astronomical observatories. These places were divination by the study of the liver and other parts of animals, the sacrificial animals of birds. Well, that led to advanced medical art. The uh, early reapportionment of fields. They have to do fields and lands. They're reapportioned every year, make new deals. And straight. That was geometry. They had to be very accurate about that. It was one time to make a complete contracts as a center of law there. Then uh, talk about the high of life. Thus, the librarian address is addressed as, quote, the Lord of divine words, keeper of the secret knowledge, who established speech and writing, causing the temples to flourish. And all goes there. He assisted the lady of writing, who was the great secretary, and so forth. Well, here one of many instructions. Well, here, there, uh, in, the, uh, in the coffin text, which is, you know, very old, from about 130 through 146, they're all formula on how to seal your family to yourself in the other world. It is done legally and lawfully. This is how it's done. Uh, I think I, I have an example here. Here, here. The text. I come before you, exalted one. He's talking about the council there. Exalted one, both masculine and feminine. Oh, great one. The great one. The great one. Uh, the Italian council. In concurrence with the council, which is approved, the sealing of a certificate ordering my family to be returned to me. Thoth has said to me, the order has been sealed, giving you his voice. This order has accordingly been validated. This correct writing for the Lady of Appearances is to the effect that my family is to be given to me. The Lady of Seshat, the secretary, of course, who from prehistoric times was in charge of records. And here's Coffin Text 143. So and so, the party of the first part, this is a legal document, see, this N, the N is the person's name. This N has taken his seat in the west beside the great God. He has opened his, the mouth of the earth, where the people are buried, the gates of Geb. He has assembled the dependents of this N before him, along with his proper family. He has written down a multitude of persons, names, male and female. He goes among those upon the shore waiting to hear the word. He hears those within their shrines, in their tombs. This N unites the dependence with the coming of his family of N to him. A multitude has surrounded this N. This N is the same person we're talking about, see, has written down those spirits which until then have remained hidden in places in the West. They give the Ba to end, to give glory to end, causing the caves to open within and to release those who are in them in the noon. This end releases their bonds that they may walk in the light. This end issues the command for breath and strength, which is stronger than the gates of hell. He's actually using that expression, the Akar, to live after death even as does Ray, every, as Ray does every day, to live after death. If his dependents are not united with him in the amended, then he will come down to the lake of the land and, de- and the devours and flames shall come forth against those who ca- who's prevented this from happening. So there's a threat if you can't deliver the dead. Well, there's a long spiel of that, though. Uh, somebody should do some work on that. Uh, a document for uniting a family of end to him who is in the other world. I have to skip here, here. If they, are, if they are gathered, yes, to gather the family, and if they are gathered, he shall not lose them. The interesting thing is there, his half staff shall not be removed from his hand, using the same expression they do in Israel. The staff shall not depart from Shev, that's the Shevet, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the staff of the family, and the individual seal. So, this language of Israel, the Shevet shall not depart from if he fails to gather them in the beyond, then there would be no great family reunions on earth with the usual parties and, and feasting. When it arrives in the other world, there's a, an interesting scene. The family is working in the field. His sister and his sister, the woman who was in charge of the great field, has said, See, you have come, joyful and happy-hearted. She runs to meet him. She calls out to him. So she says to him, Give answer. Has it been granted to you a valid decree for this family of yours? And then has gone down happy and rejoicing, for his family has been given to him. The great one of Enid's family have gone down joyfully. Their hearts are full at meeting him. They have left their plows, their utensils, their kebab, their idols, and their kinnikum, means pots and cooks, lunch stuff, their, their uh, 
here in Teens, they left them, they're working in the field, you see, they all come and rush to meet him. A very homey scene, you see. Conclusion, assembling the family, father, mother, friends, associates, children, women, concubines, servants, workers, anything belonging to a man for him in the realm of the dead. So you do this work so you can be with your loved ones hereafter. They really had it developed to a fine art. Well, anyway, you've got to get on there. Uh, <coughs> what was the endowment? <coughs> what did they do when they got to the temple, you see? We were receivers. What are you endowed with? Well, you're endowed with the knowledge and protections you'll need to reach the next world safely. As with us, one mints the table for one endowment. Given all the equipment, information, certification that would need to make passage from this world to the next. To our surprise, this is the main theme of all temple and funerary literature. You get through that, as Lepsius puts it, in the introduction to the first edition of the Book of the, of the Dead, which we possess here in the BYU library. In fact, it was it was Sage's own copy. The great deed taught Ada owned this, and we have his we have his copy here of the which this is from, of the Lepsis first edition of the Book of the Dead. He says the text supplies only to the deceased, the one who holds it, the things he will need on the long journey after this earthly life. There is described to him where he is to to be going, what he does what he hears and sees, and the prayers and addresses which he must give to whatever gods or others he meets. The surprise is that the best account of the endowment is found in the Joseph Smith Papyrus, number four, the Book of Breathings. The key to the endowment is the eternal progression of the pilgrim from one state, blessed state, to another. And the new school, uh, they're aware of the appalling physical distances and space. They think in terms of space now, you see, as I say, talking about the mummy case as a, as a module. As you approach the camp, now see, all that come, come to the temple come as pilgrims and have to live in tents, and there's a camp there. As you approach the camp, now this is taking on with Brother uh, Rick's here, you know, show them that you're there. And you call attention to yourself and say, it's safe. This is the Roman gesture too. I'm not armed, I'm safe, and I'm calling attention. That's the way to do it. Remember, you call out with upraised hands, here I am. Hear the words of my mouth. I have something. This is the way you call your attention. At the same time, showing you come in peace and friendship. That you do at a distance. That's a sign that you see. That's a sign you give at a distance as you call out. Upon reaching the gate, you print it, then a token. Now, a token means to touch. To teach, to touch, and other things, a, a token, token, well, is teach the old English and so forth. You have to have a, a recommend, a token, a personal thing. You're closer up now, you see. You, you've been trusted to come that far. And this is a tesserae hospitalis. I've written some articles on that, too, in various journals. Uh, admitting one to a closed group or party or a club, you have to have this ticket or, ticket or token or a grip or sign. That goes too. It's the lodge sign, you see. Presented to the doorkeeper. The herald trained in such matters. And, and the Book of Mormon's right in on that. The Holy One of Israel is the keeper of the gate. There's the gatekeeper. And he employs no servants there because the names are secret. And uh, the Lord will take your hand and you'll exchange the name with him. And then it adds, he cannot be deceived. You cannot deceive this keeper of the gate, you see, as you come in. So you give the token, which means to touch or wrap or hold. What do you mean by token? So next comes the token when you're closer up. Uh, and then, when you're closest to the as you pass through the veil, as the high priest does through the veil on the, on the Day of Atonement, you whisper the name that nobody knows except you. And... Uh, and then you, you whisper your name. So it can't be picked up. There's a famous story, Egyptian story about how Isis tried to get his true name from Ray. She used some wild devices so that she could get his name and endow her son with the priesthood because she was always jealous on behalf of her son Horus. So there, someone's trying to get your name. Don't give it away. It is very, very secret, you see. Well, to be at the temple, you have to get there. As I mentioned that before. So... Uh, yeah, that's correct. So, every endowment, yeah, you have to reach the place. Once you've arrived, the traveling continues. This is the point. 
this is not the end. You continue there. When you get to the temple, you continue your journey for the passage. Many studies written now about the Egyptian temple. The pa is a passage. The temple itself is a passage. You go farther and farther and farther. You get out. Well, say at Dendera, that magnificent temple, beautifully preserved. You go through these very. You go up and up and up. It gets lighter, lighter, and lighter. And finally, you depart from the roof through the villa, and you go into the next stage. And we have a very, a great, a marvelous. Uh, uh, Papyrus, the uh, Leiden T32, which tells how you go from one endowment to the next. When you've left, remember, when you've gone through the veil of one temple, you never go back again. You receive only one endowment. You can come back and work for others, but you receive yours. Where do you go then? You go to the next one, you see. And this T32 lists no less than 696 endowments that you have to get as you progress through eternity. So you have a lot to look forward to. But we're assured you will never be bored because each is different. You do, uh, what's his name, a very good detail about the name of Aspen is written about this, because you never know what's coming up next. You have the vaguest idea of what comes next. Each is a great and glorious surprise. So you'll never be bored as you go, um, uh, as you, because life is passing on. You do keep moving. You do keep progressing. We say eternal progression. That's exactly what this is. You go from one, the next, Endowment. But the next endowment is a totally different experience. It's not like this one at all. This is the Egyptian terms. It's quite a story. But, uh, well, the suppliant, upon arriving, removes his dusty clothes to be washed, anointed, dressed in white robes and slippers. Then he receives a new name, secret in his own, proceeds from chamber to chamber, from level to level in the temple. He's still progressive. He's, he's still a pilgrim as he passes through the temple. After passing through the veil to depart, he never returns again but proceeds on his way to the next temple to attire a higher endowment. Well, now there comes the question, what happened to all the temples? Got to hurry up. What happened to the temples then? They had them all. Well, the reply to that question is well documented. They were privatized. Uh, well, no, remember, these temples were free from taxation, free to engage in trade under the guise of charitable foundations, you see, accumulating land grants from the king or the nobility, along with the serfs that go with the land to cultivate them, they ended up building all, building all the property and becoming enormously rich, as the Cistercians did when Henry VIII decided to take it all away from them. They became just too rich. They became owning everything. It was owned by the temple. So they changed their nature entirely. The priesthood of Thebes grabbed everything and finally desired to aspire to take over the rule of the country. Well, you have the case of when Ammon, the high priest of Thebes, he goes to Byblos to buy some logs, some cedar logs, to repair the temple of Ammon. And, uh, but his money is stolen on the way, and when he gets there, he asks the king of Ammon, well, you'll give me credit for this, won't you? So the king says, well, let's bring out the records. So they bring out the records for hundreds of years back, and look, you people always paid cash on the line for cedar logs, and you're going to pay too. So then, when Ammon has a fit and he threatens him, you see, with a mighty iron, you, you should, aren't you overawed by, by uh, Ammon? See, that's the way they turn Ammon into a good business. You better kick through or Ammon will get you as far as that goes. So this was the, what happened. I spent my mission up and down the Rhine, in uh, the Rhine Plain in Germany. It was a medieval country and Catholic, and I traced every house in scores of villages, attracted every house, and got a pretty good idea of what was going on there. All up and down the length of the Great River, you find these great, magnificent cathedrals like uh, Cologne and Spire and Freiburg. And uh, next to the cathedral is the bishop's palace. The bishop uh, cathedral, of course, is a seat. It's the center from which the bishop, the bishop operates. He preaches. It's his, his lercatator. He, he, from which he cathedra, from which he teaches, and uh, all authority goes out from there. But he is the authority. This is the temple now, and next to him is the bishop's house, and that was the palace of the prince bishop. The dual role is taken over and presented by the notorious wicked. Well, we know all, know all this from from uh, Longfellow, the Children's Hour, and I think of the bishop of Bingham, the wicked bishop of Bingham, in his mouse tower on the Rhine. <laughs> Right clunk in the middle of the Rhine is this, this tower, the most of this grim tower. Well, the bishop lived there, and he told, tithed everybody who went up the river. Everybody had to pay him, and he was oppressive of the peasants. He was wicked, and so this is what happened to the temples everywhere. They got to be paying business, and they became 
corrupt. Uh, the priest did would get that in the Book of Mormon, too. Well, uh, yes, these dark towers were keeps and dungeons under a curse. Oppressors of the peasants, doomed to fall. And right from the beginning, there's Golden Mycenae, Sacred Thebes, Troy itself, Camelot, Persepolis, Yomsburg, the House of Usher, San Simeon, all claim the powers of the temple over subjects. Under the castle was the realm of Pluto, or the caves where, Dianaya, where the dragon slept, guarding the gold, the cursed rind gold. You see, there, which, which wipe, the thing is phony, so it all has got, got to be wiped out and disappear. So it, it's a tragic picture, you see, the, the ring of the Nibelung. The once free inhabitants of the land, you find, and deep, here's the, rag, the, the dragon guarding the cursed gold, and under him are the, the gnomes, the slaves, the former inhabitants of the land, working away under compulsion to bring out more gold. The whole thing this is the way it works now, and the prince <laughs> gets it all. Of all the people to tell us how this took place, well, <laughs> Aristophanes is the best because he can be as irreverent as he wants to. His uh, criminalist, his, his old man is a, is a typical uh, Joe, and he's having a hard time going because all the money's going in the wrong way. So he goes, because people are working, working they're robbing each other. The, the smartest people are getting away with all of it. So he's to go, goes, uh, to go up to Zeus to complain in heaven because Pluto down in the underworld has, has got all the business. When he gets there, he's told, well, he's got to, I'm afraid you have to go down there to see him. He's, he's working now in the outer office of Pluto, Joe. Zeus himself? Yeah, it was too good a job to resist. Pluto offered him too much, he said. <laughs> so this is the way it happened. It's a familiar story. We see it now. I see. But this should go out and ring all through the ages. This, this theme has been going on all the time. It gives a very interesting cast to, to our world history. Well, I'm talking much too long. This is terrible. Don't forgive me. I, uh, well, then, this is an important thing. The commercialized him. The cloud cap palace is the sta stand out in bold, bold contrast to the true solemn temples. Shakespeare is here. The, uh, I labored in, in most of those big cathedral places along the Rhine, and they were they won by frontal attacks, sheer assertion, overpowering display, a demonstration of might and glory, from the awesome horns of the Tibetan lamasery to the booming organs of the Byzantine court an overpoweringly contrived theatrical production which overawed, and that's the nearest you'll come to converting. When Eusebius uh, tells us, he was a personal friend of Constantine, he says, when you see Constantine march out in procession, a beam of sunlight hits his garment which is completely covered with jewels and talked about it, and it glitters like a Christmas tree, you felt you were in the presence of an angel of God. See, they put on the show, and that one, this mind-boggling theater was taken over by the West and combined the intoxication of the senses with the compelling force of mass action. No one can resist being swept along by the cheering section. Intercoset May and St. Augustine, I was one among them. He says, what everybody believes, I can believe and I do believe, though I have no proof that it's so. If everybody believes it, I will believe it. And this is what it comes to here, you see. The... Uh, it was rhetoric which won the day. Rhetoric is high salesmanship. As we see a lot of it this, uh, this season. It was highly developed with great skill way back. Uh, remember, uh, uh, Socrates argues with his friend Protagoras, who was guilty of opening a school of rhetoric, teach people to, to preach the law, to practice law, and engage in business. And to do that, you develop rhetoric, which, which uh, Socrates quite frankly calls he says it's an evil thing. It's making the lesser appear the better reason by the use of words. It's sales talk. It's PR. It's hype. And they developed it as we do today. And it kept up and it flourished until it ate up and took over everything. I wrote a long article on that once in Berkeley. Uh, the, uh, so, yes, remember the title of my article was used to Augustine's expression. He says, Ah, uh, yes. He says, uh, I overcome by cupidity, I cultivated the uh, victorious, victorious loquacity, the victorious fast talk, the 
overcome by greed, I went in for rhetoric and became a salesman, he says. It's exactly what he says. And you see how that, what the techniques are. Now, the great rhetoricians who changed everything to rhetoric were all the, the great bishops of the fourth century, like Chrysostom and uh, uh, Augustine and his friend Ambrose of, of uh, Milan and so forth. This power of rhetoric overwhelmed and absorbed everything. And that along with the splendor, and then you come to the Baroque, where all the splendor of jewels and gold and something, it's something that knocks you out. I better stop it, it is awful. The, uh, well, well now there, I, I another article in the Jewish Quarterly Review on the argument, when it, is a church a temple or not? They argued that at first. They didn't. No, they said it's not the, definitely the early Christians, because the, the earliest Christian writer said, we go up to the Temple Mount and look forward to the time when the Lord will restore the temple. We want a real temple. No, said the, the rhetoricians. A spiritual temple is what counts. That's the real thing. Well, they said spiritual, spiritual. There are a dime a dozen. So there was a, quite an argument about that. Uh, and no, no, this is too long. Oh, well, let's consider this now. A contrast, just a, a final word. Forgive this intrusion. Take, take a Saturday morning when I set out for a temple. I set out for a temple I've never been to before in the valley here. See what the contrast is. Now, <coughs> Brother Pinnock has told us that. I've never heard the ground covered like that. He said everything I'd want to say. You see. He said just what should be said. And this is what happens on a Saturday morning. I set forth, and I tell no one where, I, no one where I'm going. I enter the temple, the temple without signing up. I don't have to sign up or anything. That's funny. I just flash a recommend, and they take it at face value. They don't ask my name. Um, that's your Tessa Hospitalis. That's your temple token, you see. It admits me without argument. I have brought my temple clothes, and as Brother Pinnock says, they're just like everybody else's. There's no, there's no rank, there's no distinction, there's no Freemasonry or splendor, or none of that at all. Even if it's the president of the church, all the same. Well, what have we got here? This is not the same thing at all. And here is an absolute distinction. The glory of the Vesmets is one of the greatest surgeons of the other temples. My friend Ted Hume, who is the minister of the official church, congregational church in Claremont, Pomona College, where I was teaching, he used to plug for, he said, we've got to introduce the ceremony into the congregational church. You've got to have processions and robes and incense and things like that to give dignity to the church. <laughs> to the church. Well, it's just the opposite, of course, as far as that goes. But this, they, ca they count on that sort of thing, you see. But we don't. <coughs> then, the Masons are dedicated to gorgeous costumes and insignia of rank. None of that, absolutely none of it in the temple. I even shed my name before I can proceed and receive a secret name, which is never to be revealed to anyone ever, except a particular time and place, and that's the Lord himself. Having exchanged my identity for another, which remains secret, I proceed to receive the endowment. Some years ago, the presidency wisely abolished the custom of reporting in, in your quorum meetings how many temple visits you had that week. They, they abolished that. And I asked one of the presidents of that, why do they do that? Well, it's none of your business. It's you alone who goes to the temple. It's as personal and private as anything could possibly be. It's your own salvation you're considering. And this is a different thing entirely. This has to do with the eternities. There have been what might be called manifestations in the temple. The most famous being the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. Even the Kirtland Temple were just individual manifestations, remember? They put them together and had quite a quite a sheaf of them, as far as that goes. I'm sure there are many here who've had manifestations. I have, too. I won't tell anybody. But those things do come. And there's uh, nothing we could do about it here. I was going to introduce this. But I think I will anyway. This is fine. I promise you, um, say no more. And this is the cover. This should be, I should have given that to this is the cover of the Ghost Sonata of the of Beethoven's Hammerklavier Sonata. Uh, it's a, a mountain of noise with a beautiful middle movement. And he dedicates it to, to uh, uh, the temple, to the, to the priest. 
And this is what he said in, in this dedication to follow it out here, showing how they pour it on here. He says here, you know, hmm, uh, well, this is the cover of Beethoven's great and noisy Hammerklavier Sonata. It is dedicated, quote, to His Imperial Royal Highness, Eminent and Eminence, the Durchlauchtigsten. Now, a Durchlaucht is means, dictionary tells us, most glorious, exalted, and serene. Durchlauchtig means supremely supreme, I have above that. But he says Durchlauchtigsten, he makes it a <laughs> Durchlauchtigsten, he makes it a, uh, a superlative. So the most sublime, 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 and then he follows it by the Lord, the Lord uh, Archduke. That isn't enough. He has to say Lord twice. Here and here in Erzherzog, the Lord, Lord Archduke, and he's still pouring it on. And then the interesting thing here is what I was to get to. Yes, no, he's this, this. The Archduke Rudolf of Austria, Cardinal Archbishop of Olmutz. This is dedicated with the deepest awe, air force, and reverence. Could glorification go any further than this thing? He just, he just pours it on. The different thing at the bottom line is the interesting thing he says, which says, <laughs> Pro property of, uh, right here at the bottom, of the, oh, God, it's right here. Oh, just like this is. Property of the publisher, all profits go to Artaria Corporation of Vienna. That's, <laughs> there's a profit, and it all goes to the corporation. He gets the compliments, the bishop gets all the compliments. He pour, why should you pour it all? Oh my God, that's groveling as far as that goes, you know. He, and he signs himself Van Beethoven. That van doesn't mean phone at all. That's just a Dutch name, meaning the village he came from. But no, they have to do this. Sort of, so you see what's happened to the temple, and we're facing that sort of thing again, aren't we? Uh, uh, say a matter of values, but the, the simplicity, uh, how this temple I described, I could go on describing this individual side of it, it's just yours, you leave without registering, you say I'm going now, I do. you don't have to sign a register to leave or thing like that, you just leave, and uh, you come back again when you jolly well feel like it, uh, it's, it's a marvelous thing. So this is the nearest thing to an incorruptible, how could I be corrupted then? It's all between me and the Lord and no one else. That's what it is. The, uh, yes. I remember when I asked, well, when the President Smith, George Albert Smith, about something in the temple, he says, a question, he says, I don't know the answer to that. You know, that's between you and the Lord. I have no, I don't meddle in your affairs. <laughs> is it? This is the nearest thing to an uncorruptible order of things you'll ever find. How can you corrupt it in this case? It's most marvelous. Well, what I do is, is, is uh, thank Brother Philip for his talk. It, it boosted me, <laughs> it cheered me up in my misery. Uh, and I thank you for listening. Well, I wish to bear testimony that I have many reasons for believing this is so, and it is, believe me. There is something, the temple has a future. Until that time, there will be nothing else left in the world. I don't want for that. But I bear testimony that the holiness of this work the sacred calling of the prophet Joseph Smith and the divine institution of the temple in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. For additional information on this and other FARMS publications, call FARMS at 1-800-327-6715 or visit your local LDS bookstore.